built upon uh, uh, your ex experience and advice. So please don't take too time, yeah. too much time for your initial mm -hmm. initial remarks. Uh, bring the attractive summary if you want, and the more time we have for the interaction with the audience. And I will um, invite uh, the participants to um, <coughs> dedicate their um, question to one of the specific panelists. And if um, they don't, if they only put general questions, then I will make sure that every one of you get the opportunity to uh, come back and, um, and contribute to the conversation. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, Geda, this is Anna. It makes sense. Um, I believe I can share my screen when it gets to my presentation because I put together just a few slides. Very good. Thank you very much, Anna. Yeah. Right. So just one question. Uh, I, I know Anna is sharing a screen. Should we all do that? Because we, I, I sent slides, so I just want to make sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, please do so. Yes, please. And, and, and when we are not speaking, please mute yourself, mute your micro. And if you're not uh, speaking in the, in the, in the panel, uh, you, you can also uh, mute your camera, stop your uh, camera. Uh, it's all serving the quality of the, of the session. It's all, it's all supporting the quality of the presentation. And that is what it is all about. How can we make this exciting? How can we um, enrich each other and the participants with um, uh, lessons, suggestions, on how to build a better future, including uh, uh, leaving no one behind through uh, uh, food and nutrition uh, fortification, food fortification for nutrition. Good, great, right. Um, then I need to have confirmation. Are there questions? Is there any question from you as panelists? No. Good. Then I am waiting. Then I ask you to mute your microphone. And <clears throat> if you want also your camera, the first to speak will be um, uh, Hamid Jalil. Um, and he, yes, you're here, Dr. Hamid. You are the first uh, speaker to set the scene. Hello. Good, good to welcome. see you. Hello. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Very good. And then we, uh, we take it from, uh, from there. Five minutes, as I've said, so that we have the more time we have for the, uh, for the interaction and the conversation. And we just um, noticed that we have more than 100 participants. So there is a great desire to uh, listen to you and to have the conversation with each and all of you. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you very much. I am feeling proud to sit with the committee right. of experts. So uh, um, uh, my name is Hamid Jalil, Dr. Hamid Jalil. I'm from Pakistan, member of Food Security and Climate Change, Planning Commission of Pakistan. Yeah. I would just like to- Wait, wait, uh, wait, 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 wait. I don't think we have started officially and I'm, okay. I'm looking for- uh, um, the conversation, the, the organization to say officially that we start and then I will come back, uh, come back to you. Okay, okay. Who is, um, who is telling us who will get it going? If there is nobody, I just will take the decision and you can send your complaints uh, later on to uh, me. We will deal with it later on. Good morning. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar on affordable, healthy diets for all, especially focused on uh, the role of food fortification in a time of pandemic and how to build a better future. So um, 
I think we should not only focus on the role of food fortification right now, but being already in the COVID crisis for several months, it is important to focus on the situation in your own country and then think about how um, the, the lessons can be sure, shared and how the lessons can be learned in order to avoid the same situation with uh, food and nutrition as you have met right now. I applaud the organizers, again, the Sun Movement and uh, Nutrition um, uh, uh, Connect for initiating uh, this, um, this event in which we focus on, uh, on, on the practice and we come forward with very pragmatic solutions. My name is Gerda Verberg. I'm the coordinator of the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, a movement that has, um, is working with 62 member countries plus four Indian states who have committed to uh, take the lead, governments have committed to take the lead to end all forms of uh, malnutrition in their country through a multi-sectoral and multi-stakeholder approach. So, having said this, I am uh, um, uh, happy and honored to invite Dr. Hamid Jalil, uh, member of the Food Security and Climate Change Planning Commission of uh, Pakistan. Dr. Jalil, uh, you have the floor for the next five minutes. Please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, you already introduced me. I just want to share some of the experience and the initiatives and the sufferings which Pakistan suffered from due to the COVID. Uh, I, as you know, that balance uh, and safe nutrition is a prerequisite for the healthy mind and body. And when I say balanced nutrition, it means all essential nutrients, uh, amino acids, vitamins, minerals, uh, fatty acids, all that type of nutrients supplied from the plant and animal resources. So in this context, uh, when COVID-19 uh, break out, uh, the uh, immune compromised uh, population and underfed and malnutrition population was the first victim uh, and vulnerable population against the uh, COVID-19. So in this, uh, Pakistan was also one of the, uh, you know, victims of this uh, uh, COVID-19. Initially, the populations, especially the poor populations, which were not having the uh, appropriate uh, 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 feeding regime, especially the uh, vitamin uh, vitamins and uh, minerals, and the appropriate uh, amino acids, they were the uh, affected population. And uh, that uh, uh, effect was uh, uh, aggravated uh, immediately after the government announced uh, the lockdown. So all the supplies, basically the supply chain was dis disrupted, uh, starting from the processing uh, uh, plants to the uh, retail stores and the markets and the due to the uh, stoppage of the transportation. But after that, and uh, under this uh, uh, temporary phase, a very short time phase of uh, lockdown uh, due uh, to the transportation ban, uh, factories uh, were shut down. Uh, the employability was affected, especially the daily wages people. Uh, they were the first victims of uh, unemployment and uh, also due to the uh, nutrition supply. But government immediately realized uh, the situation and uh, they uh, removed the overall lockdown and Pakistan Prime Minister announced the smart lockdown. Under that, only the most affected areas were cordoned off and the interventions were introduced to control the uh, COVID-19. Also, the uh, government uh, launched immediately a program under the SAS program uh, worth $8 billion program. And under this program, a cash uh, distribution of $75 per family was immediately launched through a network of uh, distribution mechanism, very effective, highly monitored transparent system. And in that, uh, in addition to the cash program, 
uh, government uh, distributed the food baskets, especially the food forti uh, this uh, food fortification uh, ingredients stuff like uh, flour, oils, and uh, other ingredient like salt. So they they ensured the supply of uh, uh, food fortified uh, food stuff through that food basket distributed to the each family. And, uh, and also they restored the businesses uh, to uh, uh, to restore the employment of the daily wages. Uh, they provide uh, government provide special incentive package to the businesses uh, for to pay the uh, their employees uh, their salaries. Uh, also, the government uh, introduced the special packages for the uh, uh, this businesses uh, loans through loans. Uh, and uh, also supported uh, through their uh, restoration of supply chains, uh, lifted the ban on transportation, uh, especially the uh, foodstuff uh, supply chain. So all these uh, uh, interventions uh, contributed towards the restoration of normal life and uh, the miseries of the affected peoples. So uh, Pakistan is uh, luckily one of the countries having very good mechanism of uh, this fortified uh, uh, nutrition stuffs, uh, especially the zinc, uh, iron, iodine. Uh, we have the special varieties of wheat and flour in affected areas distributed by the uh, government system and processed through the private industry. So our focus in Pakistan was supplying and ensuring the essential commodities of food uh, through the uh, supply chain. Uh, in short, uh, uh, the proactive decision and uh, actions of our prime minister, even against the huge pressure from the international and domestic uh, uh, se uh, sectors to complete to impose the complete lockdown, he uh, decided against that and he imposed only the smart lockdown and uh, also initiated this SAS program of eight billion dollars uh, to provide the cash and uh, food stuff to the most vulnerable people. And this food stuff was initially, uh, the essentially uh, ensured the supply of fortified uh, food stuff ingredients. Thank you. We can't hear you, Gerda. We can't hear you. You are muted. Gerda, you need to unmute. OK, thank you. Thank you very much for the help. Um, <laughs> so thank you very much. And for those participants who have already questions, please put them in the Q&A uh, box. And otherwise, um, you can raise somewhere your, hand, somewhere your hand and ask the question directly. Then I'm going, going to Anna Lart. Yeah, that was already. Um, warning me that I had to unmute my uh, microphone. Thank you very much. She's the director of the Food and Nutrition Division in the Food and Agriculture Organization. And she will uh, speak about SOFI, but she hopefully also will give some uh, uh, guidance on how to build forward better. Anna, you have the floor for the next five minutes. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Geda, for this opportunity. I thank the, uh, the organizers for inviting me. I'm going to make just four main points in my intervention. The first I'll say is that hunger was a problem before COVID, okay? In our SOFI 2020, which analysis showed that 10 million people were added every year to the hunger statistics. And within five years, about 60 million people have been added to the people who go to bed hungry. The other point is that about 2 billion people did not have access to safe, 
nutritious and sufficient food. So that's the first point. So hunger was a problem before COVID. The second point I want to make, and in this point, I'm going to share my slide. Um, I'm going to share my slide here. Um, and from this slide, what I want to say in this slide, um, this slide shows three types of diets. The first diet is the energy sufficient diet. Basically, this is a high staple food diet is not adequate. The second one is the nutrient adequate diet where all the essential nutrients are met, but it doesn't have diversity. The third one is the healthy diet where you have diversity, all food groups are represented and it meets the requirements, okay? So with these three diets, where we all want to head to is the healthy diet, okay? But one thing we need to know is that from the SOFIE analysis, the cost of a diet increases uh, uh, as the quality increases. So a healthy diet is about 60% more expensive than a nutrient adequate diet. Also a healthy diet is about five times more expensive than an energy sufficient diet. And if you take the current international poverty line of $1.90 and you compare it to the cost of a healthy diet, means that 3 billion people globally will not be able to afford a healthy diet. Now, this slide shows um, the correlation between the prevalence of undernourishment and unaffordability of a healthy diet. The y-axis is the prevalence of undernourishment, and the x-axis is the unaffordability of a healthy diet. And if you relate the two, what it says is that as diets become more unaffordable, as diets become more expensive, the prevalence of undernourishment also increases. And you can see it very clearly here. The question is, where are these 3 billion people who cannot afford a healthy diet located? And you can see by the red uh, uh, colored uh, uh, areas where majority of these people are not able to afford a healthy, a healthy diet. The next point I want to make is that COVID added another layer of a challenge. The lockdowns, as we heard from, from, uh, from Pakistan uh, earlier on, the lockdown actually created a lot of problems. And from our SOFI analysis, uh, it shows that about 132 million people could be added to the undernourished statistics in 2020 alone as a result of COVID intervention, COVID disruptions, about 132 million could be added. A group known as the Standing Together for Nutrition Consortium also did an analysis looking at the impact of COVID on wasted children. And again, they estimated that about 6.7 million wasted children additional could be added to the, the prevalence of wasting by 2020. And this is due to the disruption in essential nutrition services Due to, due to COVID. So uh, the fourth point I want to make is that COVID makes a case for healthy diet. We all know and have read that the people who succumb to the impact of COVID show severe signs of COVID outcomes are those who are obese, they have diabetes, they have heart diseases. These are diet related diseases and also Healthy diet, we know healthy diet can actually boost our immune system to be able to fight infections. COVID has actually raised to a high level the critical need to boost our immune system. And that one of the best ways we can do this is through healthy diets. So in conclusion, I'll say that the COVID, uh, in our co uh, uh, post-recovery efforts to actually be able to build back better we must make access to healthy diet a priority. And we have you to use all the interventions available to us, including also fortification, biofortification, whatever it is we can do, interventions that are known to prove uh, to work, that we can use to improve our diet, we must use it. We couldn't look at anything better than improve our immunity by healthy diet and improving the quality of our diet. Thank you very much, Geda. For the opportunity.
thank you so much, Anna, for making the case that um, already before COVID, uh, there was a big problem, a rising number of uh, hungry and malnourished people, but it, um, the uh, COVID crisis has made the problem has made the problem even bigger. Um, thank you for also stating, and I, I would like to emphasize this, that COVID uh, makes the case, the business case for healthy diets, because um, uh, people who are not well nourished are more vulnerable, be it being them, them undernourished or um, uh, um, overweight of, or obese, or food related, uh, having food related uh, diseases, but it's also boosting good nutrition is boosting the resilience. So the access to healthy diets is crucial to build uh, forward or to build back better. Thank you so much, Anna. Then we go to um, Penyon Mikambula, who is the global program lead for food fortification from the Global Alliance for um, the Global Alliance for um, Improved Nutrition. Uh, Penjan, you have the floor for the next five minutes. Looking forward to it. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Geda. So, my presentation is going to build on what both you know Dr. Hamid said and what Anna said. So Dr. Hamid made the points around disruption to supply systems and Anna talked about the rising numbers of malnutrition. So essentially my presentation is, 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 is a summary of a call to action which has been published today and that call to action has been uh, put together and agreed by eight organizations. That's Food Fortification Initiative, GAIN, Helen Keller International, Iodin Global Network, Nutritional International, UNICEF, World Food Program, and of course, the SAD movement. So basically what we're calling for in that um, um, call to action is to, we're making two points. One, we bring bringing attention to the disruptions to food fortification programs as a result of COVID. And then secondly, we, we, we're putting out messages to various key stakeholders about what we can do to keep food fortification going you know, forward over, over the, during the period of the pandemic and after the pandemic. So eight organizations plus Sun Movement, and Sun Movement, of course, is 60 plus you know, members, member states. So Geda, if I go over my five minutes, I guess you realize the weight that I have on my shoulders and it'll give me a little bit of slack, but I'll try to stick to the time. So in terms I, of the... I, I, will, I will have mercy. Don't speak too <laughs> rapid. Yeah? Okay, right. go ahead, please. Correct, correct, thanks. So my presentation is in two parts. The first one is just looking at the context in which food fortification programs are operating uh, within the context of the pandemic. And then the second part of the presentation is what exactly can we do to make sure that food fortification programs are up and running during the pandemic and for the period beyond the pandemic. So, I mean, we all know that one of the biggest containment measures for COVID-19 is to do with lockdowns and restrictions. Now, what that does is that there is a disruption to supply chains. So for, for fortification, which is essentially the addition of vitamin and mineral, minerals to staple foods, so either wheat, maize, you know, salts, or oil, the, the biggest thing that we do in fortification, as I said, is to add vitamin and mineral premixes. Now, the premixes market are global. What that means is that only a few countries, predominantly in Europe, North America, and Asia, and in Asia, we're talking India and China, are producers of these vitamin and mineral premixes. So a lot of countries import. Now, with a disruption to, to supply systems, congestion at the ports, what it has done is that it has created uh, shortages in terms of premix, shortages in the sense that they are, uh, it takes longer to, to order and supply premix. So effectively, for some countries where they were taking three weeks, it may take up to six or seven weeks. So there is an impact in terms of lead times. But also the other thing that we're seeing on, on supply chains has been commodity export bans or commodity export quotas. So, you know, if you look at products like rice, wheat or edible oils that are fortified, 
a number of countries, uh, there were about 15 countries at the beginning of the pandemic that placed you know, quotas or export bans. A lot of these quotas have now, or export bans have lapsed, but it is a situation that we need to, to look at and, and keep a close eye so that we, know we don't make a bad situation worse. And in country, of course, some small and medium scale enterprises have had challenges in terms of taking their product to the market. So beyond the supply chains and beyond the public health crisis, what we are also experiencing with COVID-19 is a crisis around the economy. So like I said, you know, premixes are imported. For you to import, you need foreign exchange. Now, if you, if you don't have foreign exchange, it means you can't import premix and therefore you can't fortify. So, you know, there are a number of factors why foreign exchange is not available. First, because countries need to trade to generate foreign exchange and trade has been disrupted, or they get foreign exchange through foreign investment and that's not happening. And yesterday, for example, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa published a report and that what the report shows is that Africa receives $85 billion in remittances from, from diaspora. So in this year, they're expecting a 21% decrease in, in, in remittances. So that's you know, 18 billion less than what was received in 2019. So that's also gonna give an impact in terms of the foreign exchange available. The other thing that we're seeing is currency depreciation. A good example is Nigeria where the currency has depreciated by, by about 30%. What it means is that if you're importing premix, the premix is going to be at a higher price because of the depreciated currency. And the other thing, as, as we, we're seeing, because of the restrictions to movement, is higher shipping costs. So we collect data between February and, and May, for example, we, show, we saw shipping costs rise by about 20%. But by far, the biggest impact in terms of cost for shipping has been to do with the cost of, of, of air freight. So for example, we have seen you know, air freight costs from, from Europe to, to ship premix into West Africa, you know, going up by as much as 1,200%. And that's because a lot of airlines are grounded. And then the final Benjani, thing that we see Benjani, is, Benjani, oh. you're already over your five minutes. I would like right. you to concentrate on the main recommendations, how to build forward stronger. What are the recommendations? So, so we have recommendations in five groups. So to governments, to premix suppliers, to food processors, development partners, and civil society. So for governments, we, we're recommending, you know, strengthening premix supply systems, removing taxes. For premix suppliers, we're recommending responsible pricing schemes. For food producers, they need to continue with fortification. And for development partners to continue funding and maintaining food fortification programs. And finally, for civil society to make sure that they are holding, you know, governments and private sector to account that fortification is happening. But, you know, we will share the, the, the brief. I think it's been shared via the chat and you'll see, you know, a wide variety of recommendations across these five groups. Thank you very much, Geda, and over to you. Benjani, thank you so much, um, because this is what we need, recommendations, for uh, all players, like all three of you did, Anna, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Hamid Jalil, but also you, concrete recommendations how to build forward stronger. All right, and with this, we have uh, gone through the warm up. Let me now introduce to you um, the, a panel of country representatives coming from a mixed ba uh, background. We have two panelists, Felix uh, Ferry, from, who is the, um, the director of nutrition, the nutrition department um, in the Ministry of Health, not only of nutrition, but also HIV AIDS um, in Malawi, and he's the Sun Movement focal point. We have George Ulon by Valagini, who is a product development manager from the four mills of Nigeria, and he is a member of um, our Sun Business Network. Please unmute yourself and um, George, come forward to, to let us see your picture. Then we have Kazi Zebunessa Begum, who is the additional Secretary of Health Services Division in the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare in Bangladesh and who is the, um, uh, also the focal point. Uh, Kazi, most welcome. 
And we have Engidu Legesse, who is the general manager at uh, the Gut Agro uh, Industry uh, PLC in Ethiopia, and who is a member of the Sun Business Network. Now, I suggest that you all put on your camera if you have your uh, camera. Yes, Engidu, thank you very much. Felix, uh, do you have a camera? Kazi, it's great to, uh, to see you. Uh, uh, very good. George, well, yeah, there, there we have uh, Felix. Uh, where do we have see George? Where is George? Geda, yeah, you may have to unmute my video. Yeah, please. It's like you have stopped my video. You may have to. Ah, okay. Can I ask yeah. the operator? Yeah, Joanne, yes. please can you, can you open the camera of George? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's all happening. But we're doing great. Um, Felix, can you first share your in-country experience on uh, nutrition, including fortification in during the COVID and how you look at uh, nutrition in the building forward better, including uh, the, the fortification of uh, food? Felix, you have the floor. Okay, uh, thank you very much and uh, good morning, afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I think he, in terms of uh, Malawi, issues around food security, I think it's a big issue because we've been experiencing different forms of um, a crisis. Um, so um, I think he, at the moment, I would say as a country, we're experiencing food insecurity and also issues around HIV, they are quite prevalent. Issues around NCDs and all that, they are becoming a, of a public health concern in the country. But however, having, having all those uh, challenges in the in country, the government of Malawi made it mandatory for fortification of uh, centrally processed foods, especially wheat and maize flour, sugar with vitamin A, and also cooking oil. Soda utilization has been an ongoing program in the country. So the coming in of COVID, uh, largely as a country, we didn't so much experience so much challenges, except where we saw a drop in terms of importation of uh, fortified products. There was a, a bit of a, a reduction in terms of supply in shops, but this largely affected the people who are in urban, uh, urban areas. And also we noted that um, in the process, because of some restrictions that were there, in certain cases, people could not probably go out and, and do the shopping as they normally do. So, our experience has been that um, I think as a country, with the other interventions that we have been promoting, in terms of um, maybe an impact in light of COVID, I don't think we could um, largely say this had been an impact because we didn't have so much cases in country and also we didn't go into full lockdown. So to some extent, I think we've been uh, advantaged in that way. But we are also mindful that uh, looking at that, the country depends on agriculture. There was still an issue in terms of access to foods, especially fortified foods, because um, the, the, the supplies were also minimal. There was a bit of restrictions in terms of movement, especially from town to rural areas. So to a larger extent, uh, I think it, it, this still affected us in terms of uh, uh, the supplies, uh, especially in the going into from urban to rural areas. So I think that's what I, I, I could probably uh, contribute on this. Over to you, Jada. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Felix. Uh, very spot on. We will come back to you later. But first, I would like to hear from George if um, um, he will be able to put his camera on. Johanna, can you support George to put on his camera? George, as I said, is the uh, product development manager from uh, Four Mills. There you are, George. Good to see you okay, again. Okay, thank you, Jeda. Yeah. In Nigeria. Um, uh, George, can you elaborate what happened to your business um, when COVID started? How did you overcome? And what do you need to see as a business 
in order to be prepared for a next uh, crisis or how to build forward stronger. You have um, maximum three minutes and then he will come back later with some questions. Over. All right, thank you very much, Jeda. Um, it's uh, nice to be here. My name is George. Um, we talk of uh, COVID. Unfortunately, um, there have been some challenges also, even before COVID. And, um, but uh, it's like the COVID deepens it, you know, because in Nigeria before there have been some challenges of terrorists and bandits and, uh, you know, but the COVID again during, because of the lockdown, you find out that there have been some challenges, access to, you know, fortified foods has been coming and a lot of challenges, you know, getting um, operations going on because of the lockdown, it has not been very easy. It's very difficult to produce, uh, you know, uh, the way you're supposed to produce. But however, we, there are a lot of uh, things that were put in place to ensure that at least we get going. In Nigeria, it was, you know, agreed that, okay, there are some essential services, at least producing food. Once you're a food manufacturer, there are some is way of doing things, you know, you are not, we are not completely locked down, but however, you cannot produce up to maximum capacity. You know, you have to jump a lot of things and do a lot of things extraordinary. You have to think out of the box and ensure that you get, um, you know, your products out and people must eat. So that was the way we were able to do most of those things during the lockdown. And we believe things we get right. And like you said, we don't expect to have that uh, kind of situation again, but I believe with things that are being put in place, such situation will not have much impact on manufacturers or the society generally. Thank you. Okay, but you are, you are, um, your contribution is clear, um, but I ask you a question. Do okay. you think that the um, uh, Nigerian government has taken the adequate uh, uh, measures and initiatives to make sure that business is not blocked in any way, that there is no disruption of food value change, there is no, there is no, no harm to, uh, to businesses? Actually, the government have tried to put some measures in place to ensure that there is no disruption but there are still more to be done. I mean, but again, but there, the, like I said, during the lockdown, there are some essential services that were allowed to go on. Yes, you can't operate because of the fact that you must, you know, uh, follow the protocols, the social distancing and things like that. You can operate to up to 50, uh, more than 50% capacity of your manufacturing operations and things like that. The government is in the right direction, but there are lots and lots and lots to be put in place to ensure that um, things get going well. Okay, because you're so rapid and so summarized, I have one more question. I'll put myself in the shoes of the president of Nigeria. I would never dare, but I would knock on your door and would say, George, give me three recommendations from the side, from uh, the business side, in order to prevent next time any harm to the production of nutritious food, including through fortification. What would be uh, your three advices? Very good. Number one, there is need for government to intervene in terms of, you know, fortification in Nigeria. Subsidy fortify food so that it can be affordable and it can easily reach the poorest people the high DPs, the homegrown, the government has a homegrown uh, feeding program going on now. Normally, all the food that is supposed to go to that homegrown school feeding program is supposed to be well fortified food. Then number two, I expected that there should be a kind of a regional uh, fortification program set, put in place. Because like I said earlier, before the COVID-19, um, there was even uh, kind of challenges, you know, that nutrition is facing in Nigeria. There is need for regional fortification program where manufacturers are expected to, prove, you know, manufacture foods that will meet up the nutritional requirement of those regions. Most importantly, like the good program they have in place, 
the home school uh, feeding program so that all those food that will go there will be 45 foot you know that will meet the challenges of all those places then again there is need for increased awareness of uh, 45 foot like i used to say if peradventure we have given a very good the kind of the way we handle covid 19 you know the kind of attention that was given to it probably the impact of that covid 19 will have been reduced by half if we have given it to nutrition so if government can focus on nutrition it really help and it's going to assist. But presently, like it has been said, there are a lot of challenges of getting premiums now. There are a lot of challenges of producing manufacturing costs has gone up. In fact, people, there are a lot of loss, job losses and things like that. So producing, it's not easy, it's expensive. So the government would need to, you know, come Thank into that. Much. Next time I will be in Nigeria, I will recall how, uh, what an excellent advice you would be to the government. Um, thank you very much, um, George. Let me then go to uh, Kazi Sebun Nessa, um, who is the focal point of Bangladesh. Um, Kazi, could you please focus on how the uh, government of Bangladesh has responded to COVID? Because you did something, or your government did some uh, extraordinary but also how you think um, uh, building forward better should be done and what you expect from governments and from different stakeholders. Kazi, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, distinguished delegates, uh, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum, and a very good uh, evening. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here to uh, Welcome you all in this side event on uh, affordable healthy diets for all. The role of food fortification in a time of pandemic. So our enforcement will be on pandemic and food fortification both together. So how we can manage this situation and uh, no loss of you know nutrition and other things. We our government doesn't want any sort of losses of any human body for so that they can suffer. So the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic and its spread has disrupted the life and livelihood of the population. Like in many countries, the current COVID-19 crisis has deeply impacted all known underlying and proximate drivers of malnutrition in Bangladesh as well. We know nutrition is an important determination of physical growth cognitive development and fundamental to achieving optimal health, especially more important part to fight against COVID-19. Apart, this fortification is one of the important component of nutrition and its proven role and potential in addressing public health goals by tackling hidden hunger or micronutrient deficiencies, which inhibit human development and perpetuate poverty and deprivation. Ladies and gentlemen, food fortification is considered as an important strategic action, not only to enhance nutrient content of food, but also to ensure the availability of safe and nutritious food for healthy diets. Aligned with the second national plan of action for nutrition and the second country investment plan nutrition sensitive food systems systems dear participants bangladesh has made immense achievements in economy food security health and nutrition and its progress is steady since 2010 the country is on track for achieving its nutrition status as set under global nutrition targets we are commended on our efforts to tackle malnutrition. Under the visionary leadership of our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, we have ensured proper mitigation measures, especially in nutrition service delivery, to keep up level of the nutrition status of the people during this unprecedented time of pandemic, COVID pandemic also. We also have taken various initiatives to keep alive the fortification activities as it plays an important role to provide micronutrients, which act strongly to mitigate the COVID crisis. 
at the beginning of COVID-19 pandemic, production and marketing of edible well oil was disrupted. However, considering oil as an essential commodity, government issued an office order for respective government agencies to provide necessary support to the refineries to keep the production and supply chain uninterrupted. We have developed messages on COVID-19, including social distancing and nutrition for the refineries for prevention and safety of workers and staffs. Kazi? Yes. Kazi? Kazi, you are far beyond your three minutes. Could you make two points that you would use to build forward better? Two points of your prepared statements, please. Uh, Commits to keeping fortification priority on the agenda. Also advocacy is a high, high priority and engagement and meaningful interactions with all agencies, especially the private sectors to keep alive the fortification activities to address the challenges. We would like to, uh, you know, use all our mechanisms to make these things alive and face COVID-19 pandemic situation. Thank you very much, uh, Kazi. And you have more recommendations, I'm quite sure, that you will be able to smuggle them in in answering one of the questions later. Thank yeah? So you will get the floor later and then you can bring in other things. Um, put aside your papers now because you know what you uh, want to say and respond to the, uh, to the questions later. Thanks a lot. Um, Engidu Legesse, you're a businessman from, uh, from Ethiopia. Um, what are your experience and what would you, let me, let me go straight to this uh, topic, what would you advise uh, the government to do different in order to avoid uh, uh, problems in a next uh, crisis or in the next potential lockdown? You have the floor. Unlock you. I'm un, sorry. Unlock. Unmute yourself. Sorry. Un, unmute yourself. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Gebda. Okay. I would like to acknowledge government's uh, initiative in introducing a new uh, workplace response protocol on March 18, 2020. Since then, we in our company also introduced a new guideline to prevent and manage crisis of the pandemic. So uh, uh, the task force established in the company for a follow-up and monitoring of mitigation and risk that is expected to come. And uh, members are represented from each department, divisions and working groups. Even other staffs like security guards and cafeteria members were participated. The task force is led by the quality manager and reported reporting until now prevention, protection, and monitoring process to the top management every week. Actually, the control and follow-up review on the use of protective materials, workplace basic tests like temperature checking for visitors and workers were also uh, uh, performed. A training of workers, precaution personal protection, also providing different materials have been given. Well, the challenges. Because now it's not business as usual like before, you know, workers are demanding for salary raise, uh, inflation and shortage of hard currencies really affecting us. So material prices are agitated and fluctuation price fluctuation is very difficult to control in Ethiopia. We were in a state of emergency for three months. It was very tough to move raw materials as well as end product from place to place. Fortification is very vital in Ethiopia. You know, two out of five children are stunted. Even in the normal time, Ethiopia was in like a vulnerable, one of the vulnerable countries in the world. But very tough for us. Some of the factories who are doing fortification are already closed. For instance, the corn soya blend producers are of 10. Maybe one is operation, operational now in 20% uh, production or capacity utilization. For instance, my company, our, the two, especially the uh, complementary food section is already shut down for the last six months. Now we are doing only the soil tidization, 
that is also not full capacity, something like 20, 30% capacity utilization. So what's to be done? I mean, I would like to see like incentives for vitamin and mineral premix import as soon as possible. I would like to see a suitable finance and insurance products in the country because we are still having those traditional uh, financial products from the banks. You know, The only thing that they could do was extending the repayment time of loans from the companies. We need a joint action that includes all the stakeholders like government, private, NGO, whoever it is, to involve in promotion, access to finance, like the incentives and stimulants. So this is what I can say for now. I can't hear you. Thank you very much, Engidu. Uh, um, very much spot on. Um, I would like to go back before we go to the uh, to all the participants. Um, I would like to go back to Felix. Felix, you are an important advisor to your government and your government is requesting you to work with um, uh, the different stakeholders to develop a playbook to be ready uh, for the government to take into account, to be prepared and resilient to any new potential shocks. What would you do? Who would you bring to the table? And what would be the three uh, issues that you would like to put as, as a priority in such a playbook? Okay, um, I think I, I, I missed you some of the talks you made. Can, can you come back again? Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Felix, you are an important advisor as a Sun Movement focal point. Uh, to the government. The government uh, will ask you, of Malawi will ask you, please bring the right players together and develop a playbook for the government to uh, prevent a next uh, uh, crisis that is impacting food and nutrition. Um, what would be the three priorities that you put into this, that playbook? Thank you very much, Jada. I think he one of the key things that I would do is also to look at the dynamics of a food system within the country. So one of the things which probably I, I would look at is to strengthen the biofortification uh, programs within the country, we, as we are largely dependent on agriculture and most of the farmers are subsistent farmers. So I think that could be one of the drive that I would promote. Then the other thing which pro I, I would do quickly also look into is issues around light to food, just to make sure that we, we strengthen the access and supply of food to, to, the, to the different levels. And also then I would also look at the commitment that government should make to address of issues around food insecurity. Because the reason I've picked these three is where now we need to build around a more sustainable approach in dealing with issues around micronutrient deficiencies as well as also improving access to food to the general population. Thanks, Jeda. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Felix. Uh, let me then go to the uh, questions, and I will start to call upon uh, people who have put their question in the, uh, in the question uh, box already. But there is a first clear uh, question to Anna Larty. Anna, are you able to explain the advantage of uh, healthy diets over nutrition adequate diets? That's a clear question from Peter Goldstein. You have the floor. Unmute yourself, Anna. Okay, thank you very much. I think this is a very interesting question. Uh, indeed, on the slide, I showed the energy sufficient diet, the nutrient adequate diet and the healthy diet. The thing is that what we all want to get is that our foods will meet all our nutritional requirements. Now we get much, much more than nutrients from food. There are so many things we get from food, some antioxidants, other things, all of it that help to, to, to build us immunity and help us be strong. Now, because of the cost, and some of these we get from fruits and vegetables and other products. Now, because of the cost of getting a wholly healthy diet, the 
Most people cannot afford it. So the next best will be a nutrient adequate diet. The nutrient adequate diet, this is the next best because you are actually trying to meet the deficiencies in that diet by the addition of specific nutrients. You see, so you don't get the holistic benefits that you get from a full healthy diet as you would here. Because here, the nutrients that are missing or the essential nutrients are being added. So the, in terms of nutrition, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it in terms of nutrition, but could be much, much more benefits for eating whole foods than just eating nutrients. That's all. Thank you very much, Anna. Then we go to the question of Katja, Katja Ora, or Rosa. Yeah. Um, and she says, Dr. Hamid uh, Jalil and Anna Larty have commented on the adoption of biofortification to help secure availability of micronutrients for populations. What is their experience on the impact uh, which the disruptions in import due to COVID had on fortification by addition? of premixes compared to supply of fortified staple grains from local agriculture by biofortification. Whoa, it might require um, quite something. Uh, Anna, please start and then we come to Dr. Hamid. Okay, um, as we saw during the COVID period, some of the micronutrient rich foods were not available. Fruits and vegetables, uh, in some places, you know, uh, they were not available. School children who had access to small farms and could get homegrown school feeding meals from small farms, all these were disrupted. Okay, so um, I, th I think the purpose of fortification helps. You are trying in such situations, how can you find other ways of continue to ensure that people are meeting their nutrient requirement? And biofortification or also fortification are ways in which uh, you can help people to continue to sustain their nutritional requirements in these, in these ways, in these ways. So that's all I'll say here on this. I'm sure the others will say, say something about the uh, fortification itself, the process. Thank you very much. Dr. Hamid, would you also um, like to respond to this question? Dr. Hamid, Jail, please unmute yourself. Dr. Hamid. Okay, please try to reconnect him because um, if we would like to also have the perspective from Pakistan. Let me then go to George. George, please already unmute yourself because here's a question from uh, one of the participants. The question is, is the food basket uh, presently uh, fortified enough with the present um, population of the country? Pricing is an issue. I see in Nigeria, how can the manufacturers of fortified food products opti be optimized? These can optimize these uh, process to reduce costs because the region where these products uh, are sold are characterized by low income earners, poorest people. Thank you, sure, George. All right, thank you, Jenna. Um, yes, um, the food baskets is yes to be fortified enough. But we're on the right path. And um, like I said, there are still lots to be done. And you can imagine the situation in the country, getting really fortified food for the most vulnerable, the poor, has been a challenge. But we need, going forward, we need to think out of the box. Like I said, if we focus on regional fortification, if we ensure that there is subsidy for premises, so that at least there will be a kind of um, a relief for manufacturer to have assets to premixes. Then again, there will be need for you know the the, the scope of even um, for magnesium fortification to be expanded, so that at least it will go beyond um, the few staples that we have now. We can go and have more other foods that are available, staple foods to be fortified. Then there is also need for us to also, you know, take, a lot, take the opportunities along the food chain, the bar fortification, I can see a wonderful job that is being done concerning the orange flesh sweet potato fortified with vitamin A. We may need to think out of the box again so that we can 
increase the bowel fortification to some other staple foods like cassava, like yam, so that all the poor, the vulnerables, the people that are in the you know, low income and ask can have access to it. But the most important thing now to help the manufacturer, there is need to give subsidy. There is need to give a waiver probably on taxes, probably on you know, logistics, because even getting premises down to the factory is at a high cost. And that will make the cost of the 45 foot expensive. And unfortunately, we have a market in Nigeria that is not regulated. You see some FMCG, 45 foot, even in line with the national standard. And you also see in the same market, there are some unbranded foods that are not 45. So presently, there will be needs to regulate those um, you know, markets and also empower the manufacturers so that they can have access to you know, premises to 45 foot. And with that, we'll be able to ensure that it can reach. And it has to be a government policy. It has to be an interest from the government. The way the attention was given to COVID-19, fortification needs to get an attention of the government. Because if I may let you know, uh, there was a, 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 something that was, a research that was done by the father of, man, uh, of nutrition in Nigeria, Professor Ogutonon, in 2017. It will surprise you to know that he said, 13 to 18 Nigerian children die of malnutrition and related diseases every hour. And in 2018 uh, 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 National Nutrition and Health Survey, we found out that over 35% of the children under five uh, ages of five years are still stunted. So there is need to really, really focus on nutrition in Nigeria. And unfortunately, the COVID has also, you know, make things deepen and worse. You know, there are a lot of job losses and a lot of challenges. But if the government can come into this and assist the manufacturers, then the, the food basket will be well fortified and it will get to the, the, the consumers or the vulnerables and the right markets. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me go to Engidu. Engidu, um, your businessman from Ethiopia. Um, I have um, heard from a small and medium sized company uh, uh, business woman in this case who said, we want to be close to society in order to um, feed them and to nourish them. But we need support from the government. And in these uh, dire times, the government could be supportive to, go to uh, uh, private sector companies to keep their prices low um, by um, just not raising taxes or to um, give some uh, tax reduction in order to support us to provide people in our communities with, with the right foods. What is your opinion on this? Well, by supporting her idea about the to close to the community, I'm still insist that the tax reduction is not uh, like a question for nothing, because nowadays there is a, a currency hard currency shortage issue in Ethiopia. Not only for the companies, even for the government. Government itself is very vulnerable about the hard currency. One because the COVID also affected some of the markets. Our export is depending on the agriculture market, such as flour. It is affected in the world. So what we were generating a year ago cannot happen now. So with this short currency issue, we cannot import all the mineral and vitamin premixes to the country. For instance, potassium iodate is imported by government. It is subsidized and supported. But there are also other vitamin mineral premixes for complementary feed that we need that government involvement in. Some years ago, government was importing this for all the companies, supporting the uh, long bureaucratic issue as well as the hard currency issue, but not now. So that's what I mean when I say the tax reduction. Also supporting the uh, cost reduction on the importing of the vitamin mineral means supporting the production cost locally. Because it's not only for the premix, it's also the raw material cost nowadays is very expensive. So we are trying to make it affordable by correcting not only the input price, but also the long supply chain that, you know, also caused 
the uh, cost addition in the end product. Yeah, thank you. Michelle. Thank you very much. And also thank you very much for bringing the attention to the um, importance of looking to the, to the whole food value chain and not only one part uh, uh, of it, but also downstream and upstream and then the importance of a balancing uh, act, for the uh, act for the government. I go to Kazi from uh, Bangladesh. Kazi, I have one question for you. Your government is very active and you have given an example, but just like Felix, you are requested to bring around the table um, all the stakeholders and uh, evaluate what has uh, gone wrong during the COVID uh, 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 crisis and what to prevent next time and being able as a government to anticipate or even prevent any impact on nutrition by a potential neck crisis. What would be your, what would be your priorities? Thank you very much. Actually, you know, uh, our country is currently self-sufficient for food uh, production and agriculture production. But there are some issues we need to address uh, to ensure nutrition and uh, food supply to the like to the people who are hard to reach even. So we don't want any single person to starve for uh, rice or for nutrition or for any health issues. So we need to work together in a, in a platform so that we can, uh, we can uh, maintain our communication system on every time, even in the situation of COVID, so that no, uh, no people suffers from this uh, you know, supply chain or uh, any, any other deliveries of uh, rice or any food or staple foods. So government is trying to not to stop any uh, you know, business uh, uh, works or anything, communication, production, uh, we, uh, for even for COVID situation, uh, even we are expecting or suspecting the second wave, still government do not want to go for any lockdown or anything. So everything should go on as usual, but ensuring the safety measures and supply chain with uh, safety measures and, uh, you know, government is, uh, even I want to mention one thing that government is uh, trying to produce uh, zinc biofortified rice uh, as a piloting uh, on pilot basis. It is a effort for, from food, agriculture and health ministry. It's a giant effort. Government is trying to produce this. And if it is successful, then maybe our people will get really fortified I mean, zinc forty biofortified rice, which will be very helpful to ensure, uh, you know, nutrition and other things. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kazi. Um, then I go to uh, Panjani. Panjani, um, one of the questions in the chat box, in the question and answers box, is about UN organizations who need to speak with one voice, I summarize a little bit the question, um, on the importance of biofortified foods. Um, do you agree with this? What should be done to um, encourage this? And how can it be done? Panjani, please. Panjani. Hi, Geda. So in the paper that we've published today, we, of course, have two UN organizations, although the paper itself and the call to action is focused on, uh, on, on, on food fortification. That doesn't mean that biofortification is not important. It is uh, both large scale food fortification and biofortification are two population based interventions that are there to ensure that, you know, the people that are at risk, you know, consume uh, the, the essential nutrients that, that are needed. So should, should you know, biofortification be promoted? You know, I think the, I think the answer is, is yes. It's complementary with, with industrial fortification. Uh, there is no one intervention that 
is, is going to address all the micronutrient deficiencies. But like Anna said, it's a combination of, of, of different factors that are going to improve you know, and contribute to, to a healthy diet. As for the UN itself, I probably would pass that question over to Anna because she is FAO. I am from, from Kenya. Thanks. But I have provided my view about it. Thank you. Thank you very much and very smart because we are indeed going to Anna. Anna, please come to uh, uh, put on your camera. Um, would you like to also briefly respond to this? And then I have a next question for you. Okay, um, I cannot turn on my video because the, the organizers have turned me off. So oh, I dear. cannot turn on my video. Uh, Johanna, so I, can you do something about it? Yes, Gerda, sorry, it's the connection that's not uh, that's not good enough to let us do that, okay. that's why. Okay, uh, so I, I will respond. Yes, indeed, you know, uh, the, the malnutrition problem is very complex. And so whatever interventions that we can use, let's use to address the issue, you know. Uh, it's like you have different, different tools. You cannot say, I'll use this, I don't want this. If it will move the radar to where we want to get to with nutrition, let's use it, okay? Um, and, 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 and so that's where it is. Ideally, as I mentioned, we all want to make sure that the diet that we are eating is meeting our nutritional needs and is keeping us healthy and well. But it's not affordable for many. And therefore, there are other interventions that have been made available to us. So you can see that all these interventions can be used, whether it's biofortification, fortification, you know, in FAO, we, although we want to ensure that your diet is healthy, the other alternatives can also be used as complementary uh, 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 interventions, as complementary interventions to ensure that the health of the population is where we want to get to. Thank you very much. Can you, Anna, please stay, stay, uh, keep your camera on? Because there is one question. If people don't have access to fortified food or cannot afford fortified food, what would you advise them to try instead? Hmm. The idea is that we want them to meet their requirements in food. So look at what is available. If fortified food cannot reduce the cost for people to afford it, then I think it's a big failure. We should always factor the cost into it. If people have moved from uh, eating the real food that they should be eating because it's expensive, then the next best is probably to be using some of these fortified foods. And that means that the cost must be cheap. So if it's not cheap, it's a failure on that part of that intervention that we should look at other alternatives. And I think that the, 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 the fortification and biofortification has always been looking at the cost aspect, that it is cost effective, you know. But we certainly want people to ensure that their diet, the total diet is meeting their nutrient requirements through the food that they are eating. But if we keep our fruits and vegetables so expensive as we have it now, many people cannot afford it and we have to do something about it. And then they'll go to the next best alternative of improving their diet, you know, through some of the other interventions that we are talking about. Thank you very much, Anna. Felix, I noticed that in the chat box, you have added, you added something and I would like you to invite you uh, to come forward and say it in the plenary. Felix. Yeah, all right, thank you, Jada. Oh, what I was trying to say was that, uh, I think in as much as we are looking at food-based approaches, I think in the context where we're looking at COVID and other emergencies, we may need to explore or taking multiple interventions so that at least we reach out to the at-risk groups. For example, um, we know vitamin A, why it is important. In context of COVID, especially for under five children, it may be necessary to have that sort of interventions targeting this group so that at least we are able to boost their immunity. But overall, in general, I think as we are looking at issues around um, micronutrient deficiencies, let's look at a holistic way. Let's have multiple interventions, not just looking at one thing. I think it, it may not work well, and we may miss out some vulnerable groups. Thank you. Over to you. 
Thank you very much, Felix. So what you say, actually, it is not one size fits all. It is the basket. It's the whole the whole broad uh, opportunities that are uh, they are using the different uh, food, um, including fortification. But don't put all your cards on only food fortification. Um, it also resonates what uh, what Anna said. Kazi, can I come back to you? And then I would like to check whether Dr. Hamid is already uh, back. Kazi, um, I can see in the chat or in the question and answers box that um, um, the affordability of uh, healthy foods and fortified foods is an issue. Now, what should a government do about the access and the uh, affordability of healthy food, especially in times of crisis. Could you give your, um, your experiences or your thoughts or suggestions? Kazi? Uh, yes, I cannot uh, on my camera video. Could you please help me? Yeah, sorry, Kazi, if the, if the connection is not strong enough, it won't let you turn it on so that we can hear you. So please go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, it's a, it's a very vital question, like my uh, another participant, that if we have enough food, but it's not uh, cost effective or uh, general people cannot reach it, it's really a uh, difficulty for the uh, government or the people of a country how to reach all the food to all the people. So yes, we have various systems in our country, you know, uh, we have some uh, uh, government uh, sales system. So government is uh, trying to uh, reach the poor people uh, in, in a subsidized rate to supply rice and other food in a, in a subsidized rate throughout the country and government is getting it at this moment. So this is one way to get it. And another way is to like, uh, we have a few projects, uh, like uh, we have government has given em emphasis on children's nutrition. So government has taken a project huge program to it's a school feeding program. So it will cover all the primary school students uh, and uh, they will have one a meal a day, every day. So it will be a very uh, nutritious food. It is called in local language khichri or something like this. It's a hodgepodge, but it's a very nutritious food. So it, it is one target for to reach children, all the uh, like six to 10 years old children. So this is also one way to reach them. And uh, government has, uh, you know, always negotiation with private organizations who, I mean, producers to reduce rice and uh, government buys rice or other foods from the producers directly and then they stock it and then they sell it in the market and they have this planning uh, through agriculture ministry food ministry and other ministries so that they can control the market and then they can supply they can maintain the supply chain throughout the uh, country and no no people uh, suffers from malnutrition but yes there is a question of awareness because our people who lives uh, who live in rural areas or who are not uh, literate those people do not uh, you know know what are the nutritious food even though it is in their hand in their rural, in rural areas they can produce nutritious, nutritious food everywhere they have small places but they don't know what are the nutritious food so this is a huge thing we have a challenge that's why government has uh, trying are trying to reach uh, audiences with messages related to fortification of edible oil and, um, and universal salt iodization, social distancing, etc., etc., et so that they don't suffer from uh, malnutrition or they can get nutritious food in their place. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Panjani, um, I have a question uh, from you, for you, Panjani. Um, uh, the question is how to encourage the demand for uh, fortified and healthy foods? 
one of the uh, of the participants asks how to how can you support or strengthen the demand for healthy and including fortified food so you know a, a, a number of ways uh, in the brief that we published today we are encouraging producers of fortified foods to include communications on the importance and the benefits of fortified foods. So that's one way. The other way, there is a number of civil society organizations that are involved in behavioral change communications around food fortification. So working with those on nutrition rather, but working with them to integrate, you know, messages and communication on fortified foods is the other way. The third way is broadly looking at what governments are doing in terms of their communication messages. So, you know, governments can also integrate messages on food fortification in their broader messaging. And, and then finally, a number of governments have got social safety nets. And those social safety nets, they distribute different kinds of foods. And, and, and more and more, they're also integrating fortified foods as part of that. So rather than just distribute you know, foods and give people fortified foods, explaining the benefits of that so that when they go onto the market, they proactively go out and reach and buy fortified foods is, is the other way. So broadly, those, those four ways. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Panjani. Um, I go to Anna Larty. Anna, um, you have made it's the case for um, healthy diets to um, boost immunity or at least resilience against um, uh, uh, COVID uh, virus, uh, uh, virus uh, like the COVID uh, virus. One of the questions is that it's clear that um, uh, the science is clear when it comes to obesity and uh, overweight but it's uh, not very clear to this um, question asker whether undernutrition is also making people more vulnerable. Can you uh, add anything to what you have said there? And the question is whether you're able to uh, uh, share the, uh, the knowledge that is uh, on it. And there's a special, a special name there, but that's too complicated for this uh, event. Can you elaborate a little bit on the um, on the vulnerability and the undernutrition part? Yes, I'll make it very, very simple. You see, just normally the body is able to fight all infections. The body is very robust and can do that. But sometimes, sometimes, you know, uh, and that means that everything is working well. Sometimes there are some lifestyle issues, diet, you know, some other things like smoking and other things that we can't take on that can actually uh, affect uh, our ability, our immunity. It can, these lifestyle issues can affect our immunity and therefore can uh, uh, our susceptibility to infections. One of them also is undernutrition. If you are not eating very well, if you are not meeting your nutritional requirements, you know, that is also one of the ways that can affect the body's ability to fight infections. And therefore it exposes you. And we know that it's a common cause of you know, undernutrition. It's a common cause of increased infection. And then infection also causes undernutrition. And this has been known, and this is known as the vicious cycle where undernutrition in, uh, uh, exposes your, uh, you and makes you susceptible to, to, to infection. And then infections makes it easy for the body to, to uh, succumb to malnutrition. And then it gets worse and worse and worse. And the children develop the severe forms of wasting that, that we are talking about. So now I think what COVID has actually showed us is that now we are seeing the link you know, with infections, non-communicable diseases, and also even our nutritional status. We are seeing it, bringing it all together. So that's why I'm saying that at the center of all of this, healthy diet is so critical. Healthy diet is critical in ensuring that the body is in its good state to be able to fight whatever form of infection that comes. And also the body is also in good state that we don't expose ourselves to obesity and also to other uh, non-communicable diseases, which now we know is also linked to severity, severe outcomes of COVID. So it's all related. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to make a quick final round 
And I have some questions. And Guido, um, and also uh, George, there is an, a question in the question box about uh, workforce nutrition at the garment uh, industry in uh, Myanmar, I think. Are you, do, are you dealing with workforce uh, nutrition? And um, how can you encourage it from your private sector perspective? Because it's a crucial one. Healthy workers are motivated yes. and are delivering quality and are proud to work in your company. Thank you very much, uh, Jordan. Uh, actually, I have it in my presentation, which I missed to mention it. We have a program, the, the, I mean, a policy, that the CSR policy, that includes the workforce's uh, benefit. One of the things that we are doing currently is for those who are getting or earning less salary, uh, we are uh, providing a free meal to all in all their working time, whether they are, they are in a night or in a day shift. Actually, they prefer the cash. You see, this is very interesting. But we are not providing cash because we know that meal is very important for some of them. I mean, uh, some of them are not getting any, any meal compared to that we are providing once in a day. So this is one. Second, we are also providing potable water for the people living around our factory. It is almost in five kilometer radius uh, uh, community. We are supporting them as well because these workers of ours are coming from this community as well. And in addition to this, we are supporting local NGO in providing some basic needs like uh, in numbers, there are elders and children that we support a local NGO, so a local NGO uh, that covers their expense uh, the food expense actually. This is as a program, we have a budget and we are doing that. Uh, also, we are working with Farmer Cooperative Union. I mean, this is final, this is my last one. So we are trying to make our business inclusive by working with cooperative farmers and farmer cooperative unions, especially for sourcing our raw material. We say that this intervention also supports the community. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you very much, um, Enguido. George, please. Okay, thank you, Ijeda. Um, I work for FMN Farmers. Um, we committed to feeding the nation since 1960. We're celebrating our 60 years. And if we are feeding the nation, we start from feeding ourselves. So we have the workforce nutrition. We provide meals for every staff that works with us. And um, we ensure, apart from that, on a monthly basis, because we have a food basket that we, uh, it's our mission to ensure that for every family in Nigeria must have access to at least one product from our company every day. So at the end of every month, every staff has free issues, you know, that is sumptuous in us to take the family to some period of time in the month. So we, our staff have access to that. And that now that we're 60 years, that is continuous. But generally in Nigeria, we look forward to where all Nigerians will have access to fortified food. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. Kazi, um, is there an intention from the Bangladeshi uh, Bengali um, government to make meal, uh, or sorry, um, uh, wheat fortification uh, uh, um, compulsory? One of the questions. Kazi, please. Uh, pardon, uh, you asked about? Uh, there is a question on the, let me put, we need to force fortification in children. Kazi, wheat floor consumption are increasing in the country. Is there any plan, plan to make floor fortification uh, uh, mandatory in Bangladesh? Sorry, I made a mistake. Thank you very much for this question. But uh, uh, for uh, wheat fortification, uh, we have this rice fortification programs. And uh, for wheat, wheat, you know, in our country, yes, it is uh, increasing day by day uh, due to some uh, healthy reasons. Uh, people are uh, trying to shift from rice to wheat because, uh, you know, our country is a, um, a what should I say? It's a, um, uh, 
tropical country. So we need rice mainly for our, uh, to make our body more uh, comfortable and workable. But due to some healthy reasons, th these days our people are uh, shifting from rice to wheat, but not that much yet, especially rural areas. In rural areas, people are not habituated to have wheat instead of rice. So yes, fortification is, um, uh, is um, uh, we are trying to uh, do uh, everywhere, but uh, regulatory, I, I don't know yet whether there is any regulatory system uh, developed for wheat fortification. Thank you very much. Uh, an answer, maybe yes, maybe no, but there are no uh, concrete proposals yet. Felix, please, what are your final uh, remarks? What would you like to share with us? your final message thank you very much i think my final message is that i think looking at the uh, the problem we have at hand we need to hold governments accountable on issues around the nutrition let's make fortification mandatory in our countries and let's look at the most effective food vessels that would reach out to the ultra poor i think that's what i could say thank you Thank you very much, Felix. Panjani, what would be your final message? So for my final message is for the governments to ensure that fortification is continuing during the pandemic. And for those that are distributing food through social safety net programs to ensure that you know, they are including fortified foods given the disruption to fresh and nutritious food supply chains. And then finally, for countries where there are taxes on premixes, I mean, it's time to remove them given the seriousness that we are facing on malnutrition uh, coming out of COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me summarize this very uh, interesting and interactive uh, uh, meeting. First of all, um, the government in the the end is accountable to its own people, making sure that people have access and uh, healthy and good food is affordable. Hold your government to account. Let me emphasize what Felix said. Second uh, takeaway is uh, nutrition and healthy foods need to be part of every early action and should be in each and every package to uh, for emergency. So make sure that it is uh, there um, uh, learning it from the COVID crisis if this is not already the, the case. Prevent disruption. So to put it like Hamid uh, has put it, um, do a smart lockdown and many uh, countries have done it like Malawi and I think Bangladesh did the same but more uh, countries did it. Prevent disruption. Uh, the, the next message is healthy diets uh, is not only, do not only, uh, um, is, is, is a basket. Don't exclude anything. You need all parts of healthy, uh, healthy food, including fortification to avoid or to prevent or uh, cure um, uh, a lack of uh, vitamins uh, and other in important uh, minerals. Um, and then the, the next uh, takeaway is it needs to be affordable and it needs to be accessible and there needs to be a focus also on the, on the question, can it be produced locally so that you can provide jobs, but also um, uh, uh, prevent long value, value change and dependence of uh, international delivery. So look at this as well is one of the uh, outcomes. And then the next uh, takeaway is make the case of nutrition um, uh, uh, as a case, as a case that it is important to build the uh, both the physical but also the cognitive development and to nourish uh, uh, this in um, the direction to build forward better. Investment in human capital, investment in human capacity, uh, both productivity, but also the smart thinking is crucial to provide the way forward and is the currency of future progress. 
Finally, I would say read the brief that has been developed by the Global Alliance for Improving uh, Nutrition with very concrete uh, recommendations. And to close this meeting, I would like to thank the um, uh, more than 100 participants. Some of you had already to drop off, uh, but you were very active both in the chat box as well as in the Q&A. And I would like to thank you for this. I would like to give a big hand to our uh, panelists, to everyone who was here to uh, have a frank conversation. I can, um, uh, I, I do emphasize it's not easy uh, if you are uh, not prepared or used to get uh, many questions, but I have to say you all panelists were excellent to the point re responding to the uh, questions and focusing on uh, reality. So I'd like to uh, give you a big hand on uh, behalf of all the hundred something uh, uh, participants. Thanks a lot. Finally, I would like to um, uh, say big thanks to those people who have been working on the preparation of this, the organization of, uh, of this, and the people who have made it possible through uh, technical support and assistance. Thank you all. Have a nice uh, morning, evening, uh, uh, afternoon. Take away the lessons that can be learned and let's build forward better, focusing on healthy, affordable diets that can strengthen uh, the people's uh, uh, power and can support progress of our countries. Thanks a lot. The meeting is closed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you, Geda. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.